There are people who think the Bible should be taken literally. Those people haven't even read the first pages. When you actually read about Abraham being willing to kill his son, when you read the insanity of the talking snake, when you read the hostility towards homosexuals, towards women, the Bible itself will turn you atheists faster than anything. You know, we've been making so many claims here this weekend, right, that are dependent on whether or not Christianity is actually true. I mean, I could say these things. We could talk about the problem of evil or pain or suffering. But are we just assuming that what's in the book is true? That was my suspicion, right? I just thought, well, I don't know that I could trust what's in. Listen, I had a, a sociology teacher in high school, and I was not a Christian. I was a pretty committed atheist. And I thought all these religious believers were nut jobs, if I'm honest with you. And this guy was a very nice guy, and he was Baha'i. So he had me reading the holy scriptures of the Baha'i religion, Baha'u'llah as a prophet. And he wrote these scriptures in his own blood while he was in custody. Pretty compelling. They were awesome, too. I thought this was, like, really interesting stuff. Did not believe it was from God, though. But it was interesting. Is that how we feel about scripture? Is that what we think this is? That was my suspicion. Look, you know me, I'm already, for those who have been in my class so far earlier today, you know what a jerk I really am, okay? And most of it just comes from having worked cases where you're constantly being lied to. That's just the nature of this business, right? No one's ever going to say, oh, yo, you're right, you caught me. I did that murder 30 years ago. No. We have to be able to spot the lie. It's a different kind of a game, right? If you're, doing a game, if you're listening to someone talk because you're trying to collect the data from what they're saying, that's one kind of game. If you're listening to someone talk because you're trying to spot the lie, different kind of game. And that's the way I treated Chris, uh, Scripture. I thought, there's no way this could be true. I was like a lot of people you meet, right, who will look at this and say, I can't trust the God. This is ridiculous. Have you read the Gospels? These don't even, they don't even agree with each other. I mean, if you I, think about it, how many women are at the tomb on the day of the resurrection? One? Two? Depends on the gospel. How many angels are there? One? Two? Depends on the gospel. Really? That cross, there's a sign on the cross when Jesus is executed. Only a few words, like six words. Four Gospels describe that sign. None of them agree. And you want me to believe this is a holy book. I couldn't do it. But as I started to look at it and started to investigate murders, I realized oh, a lot of things are similar. Look, you know, I had a case one time where on one rainy night, I got dispatched to a murder that occurred pretty close to our station. And it was at a, a, a Mexican food restaurant. And I was asked to go in the middle of the night. I had to get changed. I told this in my other class too. And I always said the same things, right? Because when you get called out there in the middle of the night, you learn right away. Witnesses don't agree. They never agree. They never, ever. It could happen two hours ago, two days ago, two minutes ago. If I got five of you together to tell me what happened, you would not agree with each other. That's the truth. I see it all the time. Witnesses see things from different perspectives, different places in the room, different backgrounds and interests. If you're interested, like, by the way, I never ask a guy to tell me what was the guy wearing. Forget it. But girls do a better job there. If you're a gun freak, I can say, what kind of pistol was it? Oh, it's a six hour, 365. I, I have that gun. Okay, great. Some witnesses have better detail because they're interested in different things. So whenever I get a call out in the middle of the night like this, I have the same approach to every call out. I simply ask, take the officers who are there and have them separate the eyewitnesses. I'll be there in an hour. That's my only request of dispatchers. Have the officers separate the eyewitnesses. You know why? Because I want to preserve their differing stories. I don't want them to be able to talk to each other. Because if they talk to each other, they will line everything up. I expect to get there and have five little bit different story that then gives me the best robust picture of what really happened. Does that make sense? That is my job as the detective, is to take the slightly differing stories and determine what really happened. That is our job reading scripture. So when someone says to me, I cannot trust the Bible because the authors don't agree, I'm like, I'm with you. I don't trust eyewitnesses either. 
I never trust, I, I don't care if you offer me something that could really help my case. I'm not just going to trust you. That's how you get burned, trusting people without testing them. You test eyewitnesses. You don't trust eyewitnesses. And there's a process by which we test eyewitnesses. Now look, I've written an entire book about this called Cold Case Christianity, but tonight, what I want to do tonight, one o'clock, today, what I want to do, if you're 60, it's actually tonight. <laughs> but what I want to do is I wanted to show you some of the process. I'm going to cover two of the four ways we test eyewitnesses. Now this, this, this test comes from the California jury instructions. I'm not making this up. And so what we do is we test eyewitnesses. And if they pass the test, then we trust them. We don't trust them until we test them if they pass the test. So I simply test them with the four criteria we use to test eyewitnesses. This is the four criteria. Now to make it easier for you, I'm going to give it to you as four simple concepts with one word each. We simply ask these four questions. Was the eyewitness really there? To see what he said he saw? Because maybe he's lying about even being there. Two, can he be corroborated in some way? Three, has he changed his story over time or has he been accurate? Four, does he possess a bias that would cause him to lie? Today, I want to cover with you the two biggest objections to Scripture, the objections that I held, okay? And then I want to show you how I overcame those objections. So the first thing we're going to talk about, these are the four things we're going to test. By the way, when I first read this Bible, the Scriptures, the New Testament, I was just looking for the red letters. What is so smart about Jesus? And as I opened and read the red letters, I realized, wow, th this isn't just a bunch of proverbial statements. This is people who want me to believe this sequence of events happened at a specific place on the planet at a specific time. Very similar to working cold cases. I don't have access to the eyewitnesses anymore. My cold cases, they're dead now. I don't have access to the report writers. Those detectives are now dead. I've got to figure out what really happened, even though I have no access to the witness or the report writer. Those are the Gospels. That's why I applied this test to them. Make sense so far? I didn't know any other way in. And by the way, as I'm examining this, I'm thinking, all of us do this, right? That's why we're all Christians, right? Because we all did this to the uh, Gospels, right? No. <laughs> That's why I think it's time for us to take a different approach. So here are the two we're going to cover today. We're going to cover, are they early? Are they present? And are they accurate over time? Now, many years ago, there was a murder in our city. A 10-year-old girl was killed. We've had a bunch of these, but this one was particularly troubling. I was about 10 when this murder occurred. And my dad was assigned the case. And that is uh, him right there. Uh, this is my dad. He hates this picture because he looks like an idiot. <laughs> well, look at that tie. Although I know things come back around, okay, but I think that's a pretty ugly uh, jacket and tie, if you ask me. And he thinks it's bad because he thinks he has a big butt in this picture. <laughs> right there. <laughs> that is kind of odd, don't you think? That's actually his gun sticking out, uh, but, but it looks like his butt. I always tell people it's his butt because I think it's funny. <laughs> But this is a serious case, and this, this guy actually confessed to killing this 10-year-old, and it's not true. As a matter of fact, his entire confession, as horrific as it is, was not true. We didn't solve this case until 2019, four years ago. This happened in 1972, folks. And we solved it. It's the only case I've ever solved using DNA. And I recovered the DNA in the year 2003. I submitted it to our local database in 2006. We didn't get a hit until 2017. Why? Because we got it on Ancestry. So I want to thank all of you who are searching your Ancestry right now because it's allowing me to put your relatives in jail at some point in the future. <laughs> so keep on doing it, okay? That's how we caught this guy. But the question is, if he's not really there, he can't be an eyewitness. And if he's not really there, he cannot be the suspect. He can't be anything if he's not really there. That was my suspicion about the gospel authors. Look, we have this event that occurs in history pretty early. It occurs way over here on the timeline. And, and so three-year period of time. Let me grab that for you. Come on now. Come on back. Come on back. Oh, well, you know what I'm talking about over here in this corner. Uh, 
that three-year period of time. And over here on this end of the timeline, this is a council of the early church that meets to determine which of these books can we trust in the New Testament that are true about Jesus. Because by this time in history, a lot of false things were being written about Jesus too. But my problem is, is that if the Gospels were written down here on the timeline, they can't be eyewitness accounts. The eyewitnesses would have been dead for hundreds of years. Trust me, if you want to lie about Jesus, let me tell you how you do it. You wait till everyone who knows the truth is dead. <laughs> then you can say whatever you want. So if they waited till everyone's dead to write the account, who knows what's true about these accounts? And there are a lot of skeptics who believe this is the case. You'll be hearing about them online. You'll be hearing about them if you take a Bible class at university. I guarantee you, you're more likely to get one of this guy's books in a Bible class than you are to get one of mine. This is a scholar who does not believe Jesus is who he said he was, does not believe the Bible is reliable, and he's written a ton of books that are used. He is the head of the Bible department at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's probably one of the best known biblical scholars in the world today, and he's not a Christian. And if folks like this are right, and the Gospels are written down here, well then, we might as well go home and stop talking about this nonsense. They're not written by eyewitnesses. They're too late in history. But if they're written over here somewhere, the closer they get to the actual events, the more reliable they become. This is why early dating matters. I believe they are over here. Why? Because there's good evidence for this. How many of you Bible scholars have read a book written by Luke? It covers the period of time in which after Jesus ascends into heaven, his disciples are working in the world. This is called the book of? Good. Sunday school graduates. Very good. Okay. In the book of Acts, written by Luke, does Luke ever mention the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? In the gospel of Luke, he says that Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple, but in the history of the first century, he writes, called the book of Acts, he never mentions it. Wouldn't you want to include the destruction of the temple if you're trying to prove that Jesus is an accurate predictor? Wouldn't you want to show that this prediction came true? He doesn't write anything. He's silent about it. He's also silent about the most horrific event in the entire history of Jerusalem, the siege by the Romans in which they barricaded the city, starved everyone. It was so bad that when the Romans knocked the walls down and came in, one woman was found eating her dead child who had died of starvation. That's according to the Jewish uh, historian named Josephus. Why would Luke not mention any of this? Not only that, in the end of Luke's book, Paul is alive in custody in Rome. Well, we know when Paul died, why not mention Paul's death? Why not mention Peter's death? He doesn't. Why not mention the death of James, the brother of Jesus? Luke mentions the death of Stephen. He mentions the death of James, the brother of John, who is a nobody, okay? <laughs> who cares what happened to James, the brother of John? This is James, the brother of Jesus, yet he's silent about it. These are the three most important figures in the entire book of Acts. More ink is spilled on these three than all the others combined times ten. Yet, he doesn't mention how they die. Pretty spectacular deaths. Believe me, you could use these deaths to illustrate some point. Nope. Why? Why is all this data missing? Well, one reasonable inference is it hasn't happened yet. If it hasn't happened, you can't mention it. Let's just test that hypothesis. Let's just date the book of Acts one year before the first missing event. You see where we are on the timeline now, right? I could have easily put that book of Acts 10 years earlier. I'm only putting it one year earlier. I'm trying to be conservative here. Now, Bible scholars, Sunday school graduates, Luke wrote two books. This is not a trick question. What's the other book that Luke wrote? <laughs> 15 people knew the answer to that. Okay, you're so smart. Which book did he write first? You don't know. Okay, he wrote Luke first. That means I've got to date Luke earlier. I'll put it over here. Now, how do I know he wrote Luke uh, first? Because he tells us this in the first verses of the book of Acts. He tells Theophilus who he's writing this. At one time, Luke Acts was one document. Like Samuel was one document before they split that in half. Okay? He's telling Theophilus, I, the other book where Jesus did all that stuff, that's the Gospel of Luke. Now, here's why, look at the dating. We're already pretty early in history. 
So, so what I want to show you, though, is that there's more internal evidence. Here's a letter that Paul writes to Timothy. You probably never noticed this before. I'm going to show you something you probably never noticed. Paul tells Timothy in the 60s, he says, Timothy, take care of the church leaders, like your pastors and stuff, because they do a lot of work for you, and they deserve to be compensated. And my Bible tells me, Timothy, that you should take care of those people. He says his Bible tells him this. He says the Scripture tells him this. And what does he call Scripture? Two verses, for example. Do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. And that, by the way, is from Deuteronomy, Old Testament. This verse, and the worker deserves his wages. Oh, there's my computer. That's not from the Old Testament. That second verse he's calling Scripture is from the Gospel of Luke. That means that Luke's Gospel has to be available and considered Scripture at the time he's writing to Timothy, and that's in the 60s. Now, I said 53, not 63, so let's tell you why I'm picking 53. He also writes to a church in Corinth, a church he had planted around 51. By 53, 54, there are churches that are a nightmare, okay? They are getting drunk before the Lord's Supper. They're doing all kinds of stupid things. He writes to them in a letter called 1 Corinthians, and he says to them, hey, Knock that off. I told you how to do the Lord's Supper. And he reminds them of how he taught them to do the Lord's Supper. Only one gospel mentions, do this in remembrance of me. He is quoting now a larger piece of Luke's gospel to the church in Corinth in the early 50s, reminding them of how he taught them two years earlier. How early is Luke's gospel? It's early. It's in the 50s, early 50s. Because you can see from internal evidence that it is. Let me show you one more kind of crazy thing. Do you guys know what forensic statement analysis is? It's pretty cool. I'm focusing on optional words. My daughters hate this, by the way. Because they want, I got one daughter who is really a piece of work. Okay, so she would come home. I would say to her, hey, she's now 25, so she's really great. But, but back then, I used to worry about her a lot. And when she would come home, I would say, hey, before you say anything, by the way, I'm not mentioning her by name, because if my daughters watch this, they won't know which one I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> Probably both of you, but the point is, she would come home and I would say, hey, before you say anything, just know this, every word that comes out of your mouth, I am going to analyze. <laughs> oh, one more thing. Every word you could have said, but chose not to say, I'm also going to analyze. Go ahead. She would usually confess right there. Something similar happens here. You can take forensic statement. Remember, forensic statement analysis analyzes a bunch of things. Use of pronouns, expansion of time, compression of time, use of tense. But it focuses on words you don't need to use. When you use a word you don't need to use, you give yourself away. So just if you're going to lie to your parents from now on, don't use adjectives and adverbs. Because you don't need those words and they only give you away. I'll give you an example of this. Here's the first verse out of Luke's Gospel. He says, I'm not an eyewitness, folks. I was an eyewitness with Paul in the book of Acts. I didn't see Jesus personally, though, but I talked to everybody who did, and I talked to the eyewitnesses and servants of the word to make this account. Then he says, therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. He's using words he doesn't need to use. I'll show you one right here. Do you see it? Carefully. You don't need that word. I have investigated everything. No, he's saying, I have care. Well, I should hope so, Luke. Who doesn't do a careful investigation? Well, you might use this word if you know there's another early account out there that's not as careful. And there is. Mark's gospel is also early. And it's not as careful as Luke's. If you compare the two Gospels, Luke's like twice as long. He's much more careful. Then he says, oh, Theophilus, you are most excellent. That's a title that's reserved for people usually in some position of power in the local city. Don't know who Theophilus is, but whoever he is, he's probably somebody important. Third, this is the most important one. Look at this word. Orderly. He could have just said, I have myself investigated everything from the beginning. It seemed good also to me to write an account for you, Theophilus. No, an orderly account for you. That word in the Greek does not mean tidy. It means it's in the right chronological order. Do you need to say that? You're writing a history of somebody. Don't you put it in the right order? Why would you need to tell me that? It should be obvious if you're writing a personal history that it's in the right order. Well, if there's another early account out there that's not in the right order, this would differentiate it. 
And there is another account out there that's not in the right order. It's called the Gospel of Mark. If you've ever compared Mark to Luke, you will see that the order varies in several places. Why? Papias, a very early bishop in the church, says that Mark was sitting at the feet of Peter, writing an account which became the Gospel of Mark. And Papias says that Mark was being accurate, if not orderly. He uses the exact same work. So Papias tells us that Mark's account has all the right stuff in it, but it's not necessarily in the right order. Luke is telling us his is. Why is that important? Because he has to have Mark's account to order it. That means that Mark's account is going to be earlier. Now we are well within the lifetime of eyewitnesses. Are we clear? Now look, you might say, if I have to wait 15 years to get an account like this, how can I trust it? Not all memories are created equal. Men, what did you do for your wives just a couple of weeks ago for Valentine's Day? Do you remember? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Not your ex-wife, but that's what she's going to be, your wife. Okay, Ben, what did you do for your wife last year for, for Valentine's Day? And now you don't remember. What did you do for your wife in 2003 for Valentine's Day? I have had 44 Valentine's Days with my wife. 44. Oh, thank you. But I can tell you that I don't remember any of them, except for 1988, because that was the year that I married her on Valentine's Day. I can tell you every detail of that day. Now, why do I say that? Not every Valentine's Day is created equal for me. Look, if you're out fishing every day, I get it. They all run together. You got great places to fish right here in Texas. And if you were out fishing every day of your life, you out fishing at some point, I said to you, what was fishing like on November 17th, 2018? I don't know. I'm out there every day. But if one day you're out there fishing and a guy walks up to you on the water, that is a day you will remember. <laughs> Those are the kinds of remember, uh, memories that are included in these accounts. And they are early enough to be eyewitness accounts. That's what's important for me. When I'm working homicides, I'm asking the question, does the timeline tell me if the suspect is available to do the murder? Here I'm asking the question, does the timeline tell me if the writer is available to have actually seen it? It is. They are early enough. We're going to skip a, uh, one more here. I'm going to go to this, what, number three here. This is accuracy over time. Look, I've had cases where a guy doesn't give me a lot of evidence, but he does continue to change his story. These are all cases we did on Dateline. He changes his story over time. He kind of gives himself away. If you have to go back to your memory of what you actually have in your mind's eye, it usually comes out the same way. But if you just made that thing up from nothing, you don't have it in your mind's eye anymore because it never occurred. It's harder to remember your lie. And this is what was happening to him. I thought the same thing could happen here though, right? So here, let's just say it is written early. Okay, great. But here it is, the life of Jesus. Here's the council of, of Laodicea where we sort this out and decide what we're going to put in our Bible. How do I know what happened in the middle? Maybe Jesus is a preaching rabbi in the first century, very, very nice guy, he preaches great messages, Sermon on the Mount's beautiful, but he never worked any miracles, he wasn't born of a virgin, he didn't rise from the grave, that's just stuff that was added to the story over time. So there is a Jesus of Nazareth, but he's not the Christ of Christianity. This is what Bart says, Bart Ehrman says in his book, How Jesus Became God. He thinks that Jesus was morphed over time. Is that true? Look, something similar happens in criminal scenes, right? We have a crime scene and we go to a courtroom years later. Now, I'm going to put a piece of evidence in the crime scene for you. See that casing? I'm going to bring that casing into trial 30 years later. I'm going to tell the jury that that casing has an extractor pin mark on it. And that extractor pin mark matches the extractor pin in the handgun of the defendant. So I'm going to use that extractor pin mark to identify that casing from the crime scene to the suspect's pistol. Now, I think you could fairly ask, well, how do I know that that was really there in the beginning? Maybe it was collected, and then some point later, some lying detective etched in the extractor pin mark on the casing, so it looks like it belongs to the handgun, and then carefully puts it back in property, and now we have a bad piece of evidence. The people who come along behind him, they don't know that it's been tampered with. They investigate it as if it's true. By the time I get it, I don't know that it's been changed. Something similar could happen down here. We have some piece of evidence, say a gospel, that eventually gets brought into the council. But how many times has it changed by somebody along the way? Once, 
twice, you've got 300 years to work with. It's changed so radically, but by the time we get it to the council, the simple Jesus of Nazareth has become the Christ of Christianity. Do you see the complaint? So how do I check this in real crime scenes? Well, I go back to the top and I ask a question. Was there an officer there back in 1981 who saw that casing? Yes. Did he take a Polaroid? Do you guys know what a Polaroid is? <laughs> you do? Who knows what a Polaroid is? Raise your hand. Not a Fuji camera. Yeah, I'm talking about a Polaroid. Okay. Well, we used to have Polaroids in our bags, our, our, our uh, call-out bag. And, and if that officer took a picture, I should see the, the actual mark. If you wrote a report describing it, that would be good. Now, who did he give it to? Oh, he gave it to a detective? Did the detective write his own report? Take his own picture? Who did he give it to? Oh, he gave it to the crime lab? They took all kinds of pictures and wrote all kinds of reports. I picked it up years later. I take a picture. I write a report. Now I've got image after image after image and report after report after report over time. I can see if the uh, casing is being changed. Everyone here is like a link in a chain connecting the past to the present. That's why we call this, in criminal terms, the chain of custody. And in every criminal trial I've worked, there's been a big profile case. Every piece of evidence has been tested. What's the chain of custody for that piece of evidence? Is there a chain of custody for the New Testament? Yes, there is. I'm going to show it to you. So we have a crime scene at one end over here. We have our courtroom at this end. Who is the first officer who sees Jesus who's going to report on him? Let's say it's John. So John's our first officer at the scene. Well, I'd like to know what John said. I don't have a copy of that first. Like, I don't know what he said then. Well, who did he give it to? Yeah, he had three personal students. Did you even know this? His three personal students were Papias, Polycarp, and Ignatius. These three students sat at the feet of John. If I could just talk to these guys, next link in the chain, I could see, what did John say about Jesus? Was he supernatural? Did he work miracles? Did he rise from the grave? Is that stuff in there or is it missing? Because maybe he got added later. But I would know if I could just talk to those three. Well, it turns out we can talk to those three because they became leaders in the local church and wrote letters to local congregations. We can read those letters. They're not in your Bible, but they're out there. We can see if, if Jesus is as supernatural as John says he is, or is the story being changed over time. These three guys had their own student. Polycarp and Ignatius had a student named Irenaeus. Irenaeus, sitting at their feet, learned, I can see the story of cha changing over time. There's a bunch of stuff from Ignatius, I mean from uh, Irenaeus, that you could look at and read. Irenaeus had a student named Hippolytus, so this is the next link in the chain. Now, I cannot find what I would consider a reliable student of Hippolytus. So the chain stops right here. But remember, if what you have at the beginning of the chain matches what you have today, you're good. It's the first links in the chain that really matter. Now, this is one chain of custody. In the book, I've written two more. This is Paul's chain of custody through Tatian. This is Peter's chain of custody all the way through to Eusebius in the council. Here's what I want to tell you. If you don't have, if you lost all of the Gospels, but you had the written works of the first links in the chain, the students of the eyewitnesses, it turns out you would not miss any part of Jesus. He'd be just as spectacular as he is today because that story is early and it never changes. So you cannot argue that this has been corrupted over time. Because it hasn't. You can test it. Now, I will say this. People still argue it. They'll say things like, you know, I can't trust the Gospels. Because have you, like, seen the original manuscripts? The manuscripts we have have thousands of contradictions. What is she talking about there? Well, I want to show you what she's talking about because you may not hear it anywhere else. I always say, um, it's as bad as you say it is. Yep, you're right. I'm not going to say you're not. She's right. There are thousands of variations in the ancient manuscripts. She's right about that. And it doesn't matter at all. I'm going to show what she's talking about. I got to tell you this now, because if I don't tell you here, someone's going to tell you later. If you wanted to know what the original Constitution of the United States said, you could go down to the archive building in Washington, D.C. on the corner. You could go in the building and see the original Constitution, the original Declaration of Independence. You can see it right there under glass. Can you do that with the Gospel of John? No, we don't have the original. How about the Gospel of Matthew? No. Any Gospel? No. Any letter of Paul? No. Any New Testament book at all? 
No. As Bart said, we don't have the original. And we don't have the first copy of the original. And we don't have a copy of the copy of a copy of the first copy of the original. The earliest manuscripts we have are centuries late. And when we compare them to one another, they don't match. They differ in thousands of places. If you didn't know that, you need to know that. This is why he said, when he heard that in his undergraduate work, he walked away. He was a Christian before he started this. Then he walked away when he learned that. That's what he says in a book called Jesus Interrupted. I want to show you what he's talking about. Here is a page from the Gospel of John. Now, if you didn't notice this, I'm going to show you. It's all in your footnotes. If you've got an ESV like this, it's in your footnotes. Ancient manuscripts about this Gospel of John have it certain ways. For example, here, in your ESV, it says, I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. But there's another early manuscript that is slightly different. The early manuscript that's slightly different says, I am not yet going up to the... Now, granted, this is not a big difference. And even Bart Ehrman would say, no variation between the documents affects the person of Jesus or any theological position of Christianity. They're all like this. Are we clear? Here's another one, same page. ESV says, how is it that this man has learning when he's never studied? Another ancient document, and maybe your translation has the other ancient document, says, knows his letters. It means the same thing, but there are very different ways of saying the same thing. Why does one variation say it one way? Why does one translation say it? It seems kind of willy-nilly. Like, I'll just stick in whichever one I want. There's clearly two different manuscripts that can provide two different pieces of information. Here's another one, same page. If anyone is to do God's will, he'll know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. There's another ancient manuscript that says his will. Granted, this is not a big difference, but you can see there's three right here. By the way, this is just 25% of that page. So whatever I show you on this page, it's worse by four. I didn't show you this stuff on this side. But when you add it all together, this is why Bart says this in his book. There are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. And he's right. And it sounds terrible. And it doesn't matter at all. How do we know what Jesus said when you've got variations? Do you guys have iPhones? How many of you have an iPhone? How many of you have an iPhone 14? Losers. <laughs> How many of you have Androids? Pathetic losers, okay? <laughs> Seriously? You think you're different or something? Just pay a little more money and join the rest of us. What's wrong with you people? Anyway, I hate Siri. Do you hate Siri as much as I hate Siri? Siri is a wicked wench. She is a terrible person. She takes what I'm saying to her and she twists it. And then she sends it to people like I meant to say that. I got a text from my, my, my daughter-in-law. She's my daughter-in-law now, but she was my daughter-in-law then. I'm about to get my first grandchild from this girl, so I love her very much. But Olivia, she came over for dinner and she texted me and she said, thanks for dinner. She came over with my son to my house. They had dinner. They went and then she's typing this text. So I don't know her. I met her one time. So I thought, I'm just going to text her. I was driving. So I heard the text come in. I had Siri read it to me. I told Siri to text her back. I wanted to text her something benign. I don't know her very well. Looking forward to seeing you soon. That, that's pretty benign, right? Siri does not understand the word Olivia. So she sends this message. That's not good, right? I'm in my 50s. This girl's in her early 20s, and she's getting this weird message. She did not respond. And I waited, and I got to where I was going, and I looked at my phone. Oh, my gosh. So I quickly texted her back. We've been laughing about this for 10 years. But I just want you to see that, that that's what Siri does. Siri is evil. Not only that, your phone thinks it knows what you meant to say when you type. And as you're typing, it'll autocorrect your words. Yeah, I hate it too. I'll give you an example of that. Here's my son David. When he was in med school, he's a doctor. He was always broke. And so let's say he needs some money and he's tapped out. And I'm like, I'll tell you what. Uh, this is me. I'll meet you on 
Star Starbucks. How about the one on Main? At 4 o'clock on Wednesday, I'll bring you $5,000. So I send him a text. But the phone thinks it can correct my text. And this is what he receives. Okay, one of those is my fault, okay? I hit the wrong, but the rest is not my fault. I didn't say that. I think that's confusing. Okay, there you go. So I'm going to send him a second text. Here's my second text. Much better. Ah, still got one typo. Okay, no problem. I'm, a, I'm particular about these kinds of things. I'll send him a third text. Here's my third effort. Ah, so he's got a good sense of humor, but, but I should probably correct that, right? So let me just correct that. So here we go. Oh, now I'm running naked down the street. Correct that quickly. Cover that up. There we go. Ta-da, good. Ah, I still got one. Okay, look. I think at this point, he gets it. But I don't, I don't care if he gets it. My thinking is, you, you have to, I got to get it right. So I'll not just stop at five. I will text the holy dog snot out of this kid until I get it right. So I just keep on sending him texts. He's done with it. You are too, though. What business are we going to meet at? Starbucks. What day? Wednesday. What time? Four. How much money? Five thousand. Where's it located? You think you know, yet you don't have a single inerrant text. As a matter of fact, now you have more variations between the texts than there are letters in the text. Yet you think you know how to return to an original. Why? Because you recognize it doesn't matter how many variations there are. What matters is how many copies do I have? Because if I have an abundance of copies, I can compare them to one another and successfully remove all of the variations. And this is the unbelievable truth about the manuscript evidence. For it's not like the ESV writers are trying to decide between these two manuscripts. Let's toss a coin. Let's put it in this way. No, they are comparing not two manuscripts. Modern translations use all of them in manuscripts. So we can return to the originals accurately. This is why when you say to me, do you believe that the Word of God is inerrant? Yes. I believe the autograph is inerrant. The autograph is the original. But we don't have the original. But I believe we have a process in place to return reliably to the inerrant original. And that takes the confusion out of it. Yes, we know what the Gospels say because we've got so many copies. So in the end, I was making a case for Jesus. I simply asked the question. It's a cumulative case. It's built on four legs. We talked about two of those legs today. We talked about the early timing, the early dating of the Gospels. There's, I think, more than enough evidence to infer that these are early. We didn't talk about any of the corroborative evidence, but there's so much evidence, both in archaeology, both internal evidence, both external evidence. We just did a 10th anniversary version of Cold Case Christianity. It comes out in September. The biggest change we made was all of the new archaeology. There's so much being discovered every day. We also talked about does it change over time? And I showed you why I'm absolutely sure it has not changed over time. Because we have a chain of custody we can trace. We did not talk about bias, but it's in the book. I'm going to send you that, by the way, so you can relax. You're going to get that. That, I think, is also reasonable. This is what the case looks like. This is why I don't do this on Twitter when people ask me, why is Christianity true? This is how long it takes to talk about it. Any case takes this long when you're describing the truth, not just the case for Christianity. Does that make sense? But I just want you to see what it looks like. This is what I did for about a year and a half, and when I was done, I decided that these are reliable documents. So I can trust what the gospel authors had to say about Jesus of Nazareth, because I tested him. But that means I can also then trust what they said about everything else, including what they said about me. I want you to remember that Jesus makes some pretty provocative statements. Can you trust them? Jesus asked us to live a certain way. Can you trust it? Jesus speaks as God and describes a certain moral high bar. Can you trust it? Why should I listen to him instead of Baha'u'llah? Because I can test his words. There's a lot of claims in Scripture right now which are not popular. 
These are the hot topic issues in culture. And it turns out that people don't like what Christianity has to say about these things. They don't like what Jesus taught about these things. And I will see that even in the church, they will do their best to kind of squeak, kind of, how can I, can I change it? What, uh, he didn't really say that, did he? I'll see them say things like, hey, Jesus never said anything about these things. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever talk about homosexuality or sex before marriage or whatever it is you think you're all uptight about. Jesus never talked about that stuff. Really? <laughs> Sometimes you don't talk about stuff because it's so darn obvious. You're thinking to yourself, do I really need to say anything about that? You realize that Jesus also never said anything about any of this stuff either. That doesn't give you warrant to go and start celebrating it. He doesn't say things sometimes about things that should be obvious to you. But it turns out he actually did say something about all of this. Do you know what he said? It's in scripture. He said, folks, remember when I came, I did not come. I didn't, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. He didn't come to abolish the law. In other words, if you want to know what it is that I say about this, look at what Moses said about it. I didn't come to change that. Look at what the prophets said about it. I didn't come to change that. Nothing's changed. I'm not saying it now because it should be obvious to you if you know your Old Testament. This is the difference. I also will see, and he tells us, you can't just go changing it now. You can't, you can't change the smallest letter. Nothing's changed, folks. Oh yeah, but you know, those Christians back then, they didn't have access to the science, right? The Christians back in the first century, they didn't know. They didn't know anything about gender. They didn't know anything about sociology. They were too primitive. They weren't aware of modern science. Really? Have you ever thought about this? If you look at the history of, of, of the Bible, you will see if I did a timeline here, and I chart just where miracles occur, you will see that the miracles don't occur evenly over biblical history. They don't occur like every five years. We should be expecting a miracle any time now because every five years we get a miracle. It doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, the miracles in Scripture are clustered in history around four characters. Have you ever thought about this? They're clustered around Moses, Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus of Nazareth. These four characters account for almost all the important miracles in Scripture. Why? As a matter of fact, two of them, Moses and Jesus, did most of those. I mean, almost all the miracles are clustered around Moses and Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? Why is that the case? Because miracles are not there to entertain you. Miracles authenticate messengers. The miracles authenticated these men as messengers. Now, why do I say that? Because... Peter said it. First time he ever preached the gospel on Pentecost, here's what he said. He said, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, you know that guy from Nazarene, that Na from Nazareth, that man attested to you by God, how? With miracles, wonders, and signs. Miracles authenticate messengers. So if you're saying to me that you think that all of the teaching that Christianity has about gender, about sexuality, about whatever it may be, identity, all that stuff, you think it's changed? Well, if God wanted to change it, he would by sending us a messenger authenticated by miracles. So who is that guy? I don't see him. And until I see this guy, I'm going to return to the last authenticated messenger, Jesus of Nazareth. But why would you be surprised that Jesus' teaching is so hated? You realized he told us you'd be hated, right? Right? He says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely accuse you of all kinds of evil because of me. He doesn't say if, he says when. If you have not been denigrated, if people haven't been bugging you about what you've been saying about Jesus, it's because you haven't been saying much about Jesus. This is what happens. When you speak the words of a holy God into a world of fallen humans, expect some pushback. That's what's happening right now in culture. So for those of you who are in this room right now, who are already would say you're Jesus followers, and for those of you in this room who have not yet made the decision, which I want to call you to make, if you haven't, what is it Jesus, are you Jesus followers really? Because people say they're Jesus followers. That's not what they are. They're Jesus admirers. Kind of like some things about Jesus. 
That's not a Jesus, that's a Jesus admirer. Or they're Jesus modifiers. Let me take the words of Jesus and we'll just change them a little bit to make them work for my situation today. Or there are Jesus redactors. Let's just take that whole thing out. Now I can live with Jesus. That is not what it is to be a Jesus follower. It means you have to stand tall. I'm a Christian not because it works for me. John said it yesterday. It's not working for me. It's hard to be a Christian. I'm a Christian because it's true. One last thing before I go. I worked in an officer-involved shooting one time. A guy had a bulletproof vest on, and he was working as a, a, a police officer. He pulled over a drunk driver. He walks up in the car. He can smell the drunk driver from inside, outside the car. He says to the guy, do me a favor. I step out of the car so I can do an FST, a field sobriety test. He steps out of the car. This guy who stepped out of the car was an ex-con with a gun in his waistband. The officer didn't know it. He decided that night, I can either get caught with this gun and go to jail for a year, or I could just kill this officer. He decided to kill the officer. So as the officer is standing there, and he says, do me a favor and turn around so I can do a pat-down search, he turned around, pulled his gun out, turned around, and now is pointing his gun at the officer. He was just too far away from the officer. The officer couldn't do a takeaway move. He was just stuck there. Now, I'm interviewing the officer afterwards, so clearly he survived. And I asked him, I said, what did you do when the guy was pointing the gun at you? What were you thinking? He says, split second, guy, split second. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't have my hand anywhere near my gun. But he had gotten a new bulletproof vest a week earlier. And he had seen the bulletproof vest stop bullets in the range. Because we shoot at them once in a while just to have some fun. So we're shooting these vests. And he could see they're not going to penetrate the vest. It's going to hurt, but it's not going to penetrate the vest. And he just said, he decided, I got my vest on. I know it can stop the bullets. I'm just going to tense up my stomach muscles and take the first couple of rounds. Hopefully, it won't hit me in the head, and then I'll return fire. And that's what he did. You know why he did that? By the way, the minute he did it, he moved from belief that to belief in. <laughs> Agreed? I heard it. I thought he was crazy. But here's the most important part. The reason why he stood tall in that gunfight was because he knew evidentially that the vest could stop bullets. He'd seen it. He had an evidential reason to believe it was true. So he stood tall in his vest. You need to know before you leave here, is this true? Is this true evidentially? Because we're gonna ask you to go out into a world and stand in chaos. And there's no reason to stand in a vest you don't think is gonna stop bullets. This vest stops bullets. You need to know if it's true.